So in this video, we're going to be looking at uh, types of proteins. So generally speaking, we know that protein structure, there are different levels to protein structures. So in the primary structure, uh, that is the amino acid sequence. Then in the secondary structure, then we've got alpha uh, helixes and beta pleated sheets. So it's about the initial folding of the polypeptide chain. And afterwards, you get to the tertiary structure, which is further folding, and when the whole polysaccharide actually uh, folds into a 3D shape. And this is where we start to look at different types of proteins determined by their tertiary structure. So there are two types of proteins, uh, namely globular and fibrous. Uh, well, first of all, let's look at globular. Globular proteins, as the name implies, it's like a globe, right? So it's got a spherical shape. And the way that it's usually organized is, uh, so imagine here if we've got a globular protein, so imagine that this is 3D. On the outside of it, on the surface of that, we tend to find hydrophilic amino acids. So hydrophilic means water loving. So they're able to actually interact with the aqueous environment, either inside the, uh, inside the cell in the, with the cytoplasm, or it could be uh, outside the cell in the tissue fluid or in the bloodstream. Whereas on the inside, imagine if we can look on the inner structure uh, of that, on the inside, we get the hydrophobic amino acids. So as the name implies, hydrophobic, phobic means fear. So hydrophobic amino acids do not like to interact with water. They cannot interact with water. So they are what we call non-polar amino acids. So the arrangement of, uh, of the amino acids during folding, they will have the hydrophilic ones on the outside so that they can interact with the water and the hydrophobic ones are shielded inside um, uh, the actual globular protein. And that is why, in, because of this arrangement, we say that the globular proteins are actually soluble in water. So they are able to actually interact with the aqueous environment because of this particular arrangement. And because of this particular sort of property, we can then determine the uh, functions of a lot of globular proteins. So for example, uh, we can, uh, in the bloodstream, we can find uh, plasma, which takes up about 55% of the bloodstream. And in the plasma, they carry the, all the blood cells uh, and nutrients like glucose, etc. but they also have plasma proteins in them. Um, and those proteins exist in the bloodstream. Uh, they can mingle with the water, therefore they are globular uh, proteins. Another example that we can uh, look at is uh, enzymes. So enzymes catalyze chemical reactions and they are globular in shape so that they could actually do that uh, to catalyze that particular reaction and form the active site. Whereas hemoglobin, which is not an enzyme, hemoglobin are uh, proteins found in red blood cells that actually carry and bind to oxygen molecules. So they are basically the ones that transport the oxygen around. Now, some of the enzymes and also hemoglobin in particular, they actually have, uh, they're not just globular proteins, but they are what we call conjugated proteins. So if we just look at hemoglobin specifically and actually you will need to know a bit more about hemoglobin in chapter 8 about the transport in animals right so hemoglobin actually is made up of four subunits so actually it's one of those proteins that demonstrate quaternary structure when you've got four different polypeptides joining together right so we, we say that hemoglobin is made up of two alpha subunits and two beta subunits Let's say we look at one of the subunits here, actually inside that subunit, it's got a particular, what we call a heme group in the hemoglobin. And this one basically uh, contains in the hemoglobin, it's got um, an iron two plus ion. And this is what we call a prosthetic group. So if you think about prosthetic arms or prosthetic limb, a uh, prosthetic group is an inorganic component that is found in a protein. So it's not made up of amino acids. And you can see here, it's actually not organic at all. It's a, it's a metal ion. And any protein that carries a prosthetic group is called a conjugated protein. So hemoglobin is an example of a globular conjugated protein because it's globular in shape and it carries a prosthetic group. Sometimes certain enzymes can also carry 
uh, prosthetic grips in them, so they are also examples of conjugated protein, so they might carry uh, other metal ions or non even non-metal ions as well to support their functions. And you'll actually learn more about prosthetic groups in chapter 4 about enzymes, and you'll learn more about hemoglobin in chapter 8 about transport in animals, so specifically how they actually interact with oxygen in the, in the reptile cells. So another type of protein uh, is called fibrous protein, and I mean, as the name implies, they are fiber-like. They've got a fiber-like shape, so they are kind of usually existing in strands. Um, and usually, what you'll find is not just an individual protein, as in like a single strand. What they tend to have is like they the proteins form multiple strands, and then all of those strands kind of join up together to form an actual fibrous protein. And with the with the strands, what we tend to also find. Uh, within each fibrous protein would be a lot of uh, covalent bonds, uh, specifically uh, disulfide bridges. Keeping in mind that disulfide bridges are the strongest bond actually found in the tertiary and quaternary structure. So one of the key things they found in research when they're comparing the ratio of hydrophilic to hydrophobic amino acids in globular versus fibrous, they've got a different percentage, right? They've got a different distribution of that. Uh, and in fibrous, what they found out was that the amino acids are arranged in such a way that the uh, hydrophilic ones are just so happen to be kind of twisted to, uh, around on, uh, to face the outside of it, whereas the hydrophobic ones are just so happen to be facing uh, towards maybe another strand as well. So it's kind of got a similar concept of shielding as we saw in the globular uh, proteins, but not as specifically like a ball, but it was just like just about as it as the strands twist together to form a helical structure, they are kind of shielded away. And we do tend to find a lot of disulfide bridges in fibrous proteins and all of these together, uh, but the strands having disulfide bridges and also the strands in between them might also have hydrogen bonds. And keeping in mind the same concept, hydrogen bonds are very weak, but the thing is when there's a bunch of them together, they actually can form a very stable and compact structure. Now, because of these particular bonds that are found in fiber structure, they tend to serve a, uh, a function for structural support. So they tend to be insoluble in water, but that's a good thing because they provide structural support. So there are several examples of fibrous proteins that we can look at. Um, one of them is collagen, uh, which we can find in a lot of bones or cartilage and connective tissues. Uh, we can also, uh, one another example is keratin, which we do find in uh, our skin as well, uh, and also elastin, which you can uh, which, you, as the name implies, is, can be a little bit elastic, but also can provide a structural support. So just to summarize, there are two major types of proteins. We've got globular and fibrous. Globular proteins, uh, as you can see, can also be conjugated proteins if they've got a prosthetic group, and they tend to be uh, enzymes and transport proteins, whereas fibrous proteins tend to uh, be structural proteins, so they are the ones that provide support to any structures that we find in the body, like bones and cartilage. One key thing to remember is it doesn't matter what proteins they throw at you in an exam question. The key thing to remember is this. The structure of a molecule determines the function of that molecule. So it doesn't matter like what protein they throw at you. They, you can look at the information that they provided and read the information they provided and see if they have specifically mentioned any particular structures or properties. And then from there, you can actually determine what they do or think about a protein that you've come across before that has a very similar structure. And then you can then suggest the function of that unknown protein that they gave you in an exam question. So structure determines function. This kind of it's like the golden thing to remember in the whole of biochemistry. It doesn't matter if it's a protein, a carbohydrate, or if it's a lipid or nucleic acid, it doesn't actually matter. The structure of any molecule always determines the function and properties of that molecule. So keep that in mind when you tackle any exam questions that you get.